A contestant, after demeaning marriage, supposedly as a joke on Family Feud, went on to actually attack his wife in a rage, leaving many people to wonder whether his jokes were actually foreshadowing events to come. Every once in a while, a reality show contestant will go on to commit some sort of awful crime that makes us wonder how these seemingly normal people can pull off something so horrific. This is one of those cases, but let's start back at the beginning to really get the full scope. On September 18th of 2009, Becky and Timothy Bleefnik got married after dating for a few years. After getting married, Becky graduated summa cum laude from Blessing Riemann College of Nursing and Health Sciences. While doing so, she even received the Faculty Outstanding Senior Award. Even more impressively, she gave birth to her third child toward the end of her senior year and only ended up missing one day of school. She was pretty accomplished, to say the least. After graduating, she worked as a nurse in gastrointestinal surgery before moving on to working in a hospital emergency room. In addition to her RN credentials, she also worked as both a certified trauma nurse specialist and sexual assault nurse examiner. Once the pandemic started back in 2020, Becky took up a second gig working as a travel nurse in both Kirksville and Hannibal, Missouri. While doing so, she was nominated for the International Daisy Award, an award that honors nurses who really go above and beyond. One patient who nominated her said, I got to kiss my husband and tell him how much I love him all because of Becky. There are no words to express how grateful I am for her and what she did. After all of that, she finally ended up settling down in a position working in vascular access while working towards her nurse practitioner certification. As dedicated to her career and schooling as she was, she didn't put her family on the back burner. Being the mother of several boys, she had to go through the trouble of juggling them all while going to work and school. Still, she had the time to make Halloween costumes for them, go fishing with them, and even hunt for frogs together. She thanked her Catholic faith for giving her the drive to manage all of this. After a while, Becky's husband, Timothy, became a contestant on the popular American game show, Family Feud. I'm sure most of you out there have at least seen clips of the show, if not having seen it on TV yourself. One of the most well-known aspects of the show is when the host, Steve Harvey, reacts in disappointment whenever a contestant gives a vulgar or shocking response to a question. Timothy was one of those contestants. Timothy's episode was recorded in 2019 and aired in 2020. While his family was not on the panel with him, he was asked a question, what's the biggest mistake you made at your wedding, with the task of predicting the most common answer people gave to that question in a survey. When asked, he gave this response. What's the biggest mistake you made at your wedding? Honey, I love you, but said I do. Oh. <laughs> not my mistake. Not my mistake. I love my wife. Nobody out there, including Tim's own wife, was really surprised at his answer to the question. They felt that this was pretty par for the course, being just his type of humor, pretty deadpan and a little bit insulting. That's just kind of how he was, said Becky's sister Sarah in relation to the joke. It was not really anything out of the ordinary. With Tim asserting that his answer wasn't related to his own marriage in any sort of way, the comment was taken as the usual, funny, clippable sort of moment the show is known for. But it would provide a bit of foreshadowing. Tim and Becky's marriage, unfortunately, did not last. After just over 10 years of marriage, the couple went on to divorce in 2021. The divorce was not a smooth one. It seems that Tim's mental health had been gradually deteriorating over time, with him making comments that would worry Becky more and more as time went on. She told her sister, I am putting this in writing that I'm fearful he will somehow harm me, come after me, or will try to do something to me that takes me away from the kids or the kids away from me. He already has lied multiple times to paint himself as a victim and me as a perpetrator when it is absolutely the other way around. It seems that Becky knew certain secret details about Tim's father that Tim was very afraid she would leak. Becky said, He told me that if I outed his dad that he, the dad, would probably have to move and then kill himself. Speaking of the father, she added, I absolutely think he will try to take the kids sometime. By June of 2021, Becky was sending more and more concerning Facebook messages to her friends detailing the ongoing issues with the divorce. She told one friend, without elaborating, that she didn't want Tim's father to ever have contact with her kids again. More than anything, she was very worried that he would try to run off with the kids. She said that she believed that Tim had, in her own words, true mental health problems. This was to the extent that she wanted to get an order of protection but was scared to go through the process. Becky's sister said, So, I received the text message that I testified to in court in September of 2021, and we knew that the divorce was contentious before that. 
But that was the first time where she illuminated or she made clear that, you know, something is dramatically wrong. She says she wanted to put it in writing that if something ever happened to her, we should first think of him. Shortly after, Becky started to tell her friends about Tim's behavior that had been growing gradually more concerning. She feared what he might do if he didn't end up with custody of the kids. He scraped at my face. He has shoved me across the room where the kids and I are standing. He's punched a hole in the wall. If things really didn't go his way, I feel he can be very unstable and unpredictable. By November, Becky had a new attorney. According to this man, Becky had been requesting that Tim return a 9mm handgun that she owned, and he, time and time again, refused to do so. Then, she couldn't wait any longer. The very next month, she went ahead and started going through the process of getting an order of protection against, well, not Tim, but his father for the time being. That brings us to the year 2022. The divorce had been going on for almost a year now, and it wasn't getting any easier. Becky, confiding in her friends once again, said, If he doesn't get his way, he may literally lose his mind. It had gotten to the point where Tim's behavior was so erratic and unpredictable that the court had to come up with a plan as to how the couple would exchange kids for visitation, saying that both Tim and Becky must stay within three feet of their own cars while trading the kids. Things remained in that pattern all the way up to the next year. In early 2023, Becky ran into one of her friends while shopping at a TJ Maxx store. Her friend noted that she appeared mentally exhausted, losing that bright optimism she once had. They talked about the divorce and how Becky lived in fear of Tim snapping and doing something crazy at any moment. Apparently, Tim had told her, You'll be dead before you get any of my money. Sometime that month, Tim ventured back to the family home and asked a neighbor if he happened to have any security cameras pointed toward the family's backyard. After, Tim called the police and asked if they would mind returning the 9mm handgun back to Becky because he didn't want to give it to her in person himself. The police didn't go along with it. Shortly after, Tim began plotting. He bought a bicycle on Facebook Marketplace under a fake name and started riding it from his new residence back to the family home, over and over, scoping out both the route and the home, trying to get a gauge of how tight surveillance was in the area. Becky had managed to start dating during all of this, getting involved with a man named Ted. The night before Valentine's Day in 2023, Ted drove over to her home shortly before midnight and crashed there until the morning. Just after midnight, Tim was on one of his rides. He disconnected his Whoop armband, a fitness armband that can measure your activity, and locked his phone. Becky's neighbor got an alert saying that a moving object was detected on his driveway security camera, showing a person pacing up and down the driveway. After scoping out Ted's car at the home for a while, Tim hopped back onto his bike and returned to the rental home in which he was staying. He started searching for the car's license plate online for about 30 minutes. I know it's almost become a meme on this channel at this point, but his search history went on to detail exactly what he was thinking at the time. He searched for a license plate lookup, title registration lookup, VIN number lookup, and license plate lookup, all while searching for Ted's specific license plate number and vehicle identification number. Shortly after, he reconnected his Whoop armband and called up the Missouri Department of Revenue, looking for whoever handled vehicle registrations, further trying to see who owned the vehicle. After these Google adventures, it seems he finally found Ted's name. With the stress of the apparent new lover and the upcoming March 3rd divorce trial, Tim started to snap. Becky was due to get some abdominal surgery. To prep for that, she stayed with a good friend for a few days and for a while after. Waiting for her to return home, Tim continued his nightly bike rides. On February 21st, Becky finally returned home. Surveillance footage from a nearby barn showed a man on a bicycle riding southbound toward her home. Becky talked with Ted, asking if he could keep the kids for the next two days while she recovered from surgery. He agreed, but this would be the last time he would ever see her alive. Two nights later, February 23rd, 12.30 a.m. Tim's Whoop armband disconnected from his phone once again, and the usual video footage showed a bicycle rider heading off toward the house. Their kids had returned home by this point, and the family had gone to bed. Tim broke into the home and searched for Becky, holding the very 9mm handgun that he had refused to return to her, complete with a homemade silencer attached. Becky began to call 911, but dropped her phone and it bounced behind the bedroom door. Timothy looked her in the eyes and shot her multiple times. She fell to the ground and he continued to shoot her even more, all while the children were upstairs in bed. In total, he shot her 14 times from various angles at close, near point-blank range. Then, Tim fled. At 2 a.m., he had returned home, reconnecting his armband. He felt that he had hidden his tracks perfectly. Now, here's a bit of confusion. 
It seems that the kids woke up and went to school on their own, thinking that their mother was asleep, as later statements have confirmed that they were in the house at the time of the shooting. Either way, the kids went on to school, and Tim called up the place, telling the school not to let them walk home to Becky's house that night. Arriving to the school to pick them up himself an hour before school even let out, Tim waited outside. He texted Becky's father, Bill, asking if he can call her and find out when she's going to pick up the kids, saying that the school had called him and told him that nobody came to pick them up. Bill went out to Becky's house to check on her, only to find her shot to death inside the home. He ran to the neighbor's house in a panic to use their phone and dial 911. Becky's mom called Tim, telling him about the discovery. He responded with a seemingly shocked, what? pretending he was just as surprised as they were. The police came out to question him and he was given a DNA swab test. About a week later, the police found Tim's bike abandoned by a public school bus depot. Then they went on to search his home. There, the police found what they called damning evidence, including his internet search history, which had now expanded to include such queries as how to break into a window with a crowbar, how to create a homemade gun silencer, and average police response time. Not exactly subtle. On March 13th, Tim was officially arrested and charged with Becky's murder. By May, he was on trial. His charges were one count of first-degree murder and one count of home invasion. During the week-long trial, he told the police that he felt his wife was merely the victim of a random, violent home invasion. The prosecutors felt that this was obviously not the case, laying the evidence out in front of him for all to see. It didn't leave much doubt. Prosecutors believed that he broke into her home and killed her in a jealous rage after seeing Ted's car in the driveway. Becky's family made their own statements. Becky's death was gruesome, painful, and senseless. You wanted her to suffer. You have ripped Becky away from my parents. The same people that welcomed you into our family. The same people you once called mom and dad. The same people you called on February 23rd, knowing Becky was already dead, feigning concern that she had not shown up to pick up the boys. How many times did you practice your reaction, knowing they would soon call to tell you that she was dead? Your children's future will be forever impacted by your crime. They're already suffering. Jurors convicted him of first-degree murder after a week-long trial, only deliberating for about four hours total before returning a verdict. The Adams County judge, Robert Adrian, said, Mr. Bleefneck, you researched this murder. You planned this murder. You researched this murder. You planned this murder. You practiced this murder. You broke into her house and you shot her. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen times. I don't know how long it took you to do that. Some of those shots were fired while she was lying on the ground. And you did all of that while your children was up, were upstairs at your house, lying snug in their beds. Tim, donning orange and white prison clothes, declined to make any sort of statement after his sentence was handed down. His attorney said that they planned to file an appeal and were disappointed with the verdict, although they respected the decision. Kind of. Tim was scheduled to be sentenced on August 11th, facing life in prison. However, he didn't only get a life sentence, he was slapped with three life sentences. After the verdict, prosecutors said, Nothing we did was going to bring Becky Bleefneck back. And at the end of the day, there are still three little boys who lost their mother in a violent and tragic way, and now they've lost their father. Once again, thank you for watching my video. Go ahead and give it a like if you want to help me out in the algorithm, and feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content like this. If you want, go ahead and follow me on social media, I post stuff there, and if you want to help the channel out even more, go ahead and become a channel member or follow me on Patreon, link in the description below. And speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. We've got... Jake Parsons, Rabid Snarf, Royal Pain and Ass, Kylie, Jada, Dana Hart, Anna B, Sunrider, Gabrielle Tansic, Lee aka Crust, Emilia Morales, George Lopez, Minitina, Ron Murillo, Travis Billings, Jason Whitehurst, Jim Dowell, Kimmy Leffel, Molina Lee Williams Haas, Impalato, Stephen Jamie Kramer, 
Max Sword Guy, Hao Yang, April Diamond, Starfade, Elixir, Angie, Rick of Work in Progress USA, Sass Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Buttery Frankus, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Alan Damiani, Adrian Lawley, Marsh, Rinsenstein, Kim Peek, Lex Luthor, Lux Alpaca, CSD, Scoochie Main, Jackie, and Mark Barnett. You are all cream of the crop, best, better than other people, probably. This has been your host, Kyle. Thank you, and good night.